Ken, you own the. Thank you, George. Um, I'm going to start out before we have any questions or anything. I'm going to show you a video, which is about uh, six minutes long. And actually, let me show you two videos. I'll, after the first video, we'll have some questions about uh, microgrids and what they are. And then I'll show you another video, which is particular to Oakmont. So uh, I'm sure screen here. Uh, see which one it is this one. And I got to share the sound. Okay. All right. Let's hope this works. We all rely on energy to light our lives and power our worlds. But how that energy is generated and delivered is changing fast. One way that it's happening is through microgrids. The traditional centralized utility grid is a big interconnected network that takes energy from large faraway energy generation plants and transmits it over long distances to consumers. As technologies and policies continue to evolve, communities and businesses can choose to supply their own energy locally by building their own microgrid. A microgrid is a group of interconnected energy users and distributed energy resources. These are energy systems that can include solar panels, batteries, wind turbines, and combined heat and power plants. This means that energy is generated closer to where it's needed. The microgrid, which can be connected to the larger central grid, can function as supplement or operate independently, providing a secure backup when there's an outage. And these distributed energy resources are all great ways to generate clean, renewable energy. Homes, businesses, and buildings can become more energy independent, tapping into a flexible and reliable energy supply that reduces greenhouse gas emissions and lowers carbon footprints. And because microgrids are so efficient, they also save on energy costs. As energy becomes ever more critical in our daily lives, microgrids will enable us to shift from central power generation to local, flexible, reliable forms of sustainable power and thermal energy. So when disaster strikes, we'll still have all the energy we need to power through life. Find out how we can do this for you. Veolia, resourcing the world. Let's face it. No serious person can dismiss climate change. We see the signs. We know the consequences. And there is one thing we know for sure. Time is running out. We must reimagine the way we create, distribute, and use energy. We are working on solutions. Some are incremental. But we need to think big, really big. At its peak in 1970, the wired phone system serviced only 23% of the world. Today, over 96% or over 7 billion people have access to wireless mobile phones. Now, let's apply this revolution to our power grid. What we have now is a centralized power grid delivered by an antiquated network of wires, vulnerable to natural disasters, decaying infrastructure, terrorist cyber attack, so last century. The energy grid of the future will be decentralized, based on harvested green energy with storage, eliminating our dependence on fossil fuels forever. And we will make it happen with microgrids. Microgrids harness green sourced energy, like solar and wind, to provide 100% renewable energy to smaller, community-based systems with the help of smart buildings, public facilities, campuses, communities, and consumers. A sustainable balance can be achieved between sources and energy-consuming devices. And we can do it here, in California, in 10 years or less if we choose. And when we microgrid California, the nation and the world will follow. Now, you're probably asking, how much will this cost? It won't cost the average citizen, the ratepayer, anything more than you are already spending for your energy. 
Committing to clean energy microgrids would explode growth in private and public infrastructure. As our system becomes more efficient and renewable infrastructure expands, unused energy can be stored in standard batteries or a growing array of clean storage technologies. It can also be converted into hydrogen reserves that provide extended security against outages, natural disasters, seasonal variation or cyber attack. We can even sell the excess hydrogen as fuel to power our cars, buses, trains, and our entire transportation system. All this with no additional cost to the ratepayer. This makes our economy truly sustainable and 100% green. So how do we make this happen? The answer is you. We need to use our votes to elect leaders who support a green economy. Educate those around you about microgrids fueled by emerging hydrogen economy. Help promote the use of solar and other renewable resources for energy independence. Let's pull together and make it our mission to say no to compromised politicians. No to big oil and fossil fuel companies and yes to a green future. If not us, who? If not now, when? The future has arrived, and we must embrace it for human civilization to survive climate change. Visit us at the World Business Academy, where we believe the business community must provide social leadership as a steward for a healthy planet and a healthy human civilization and a vibrant, dynamically growing economy. Microgrids are growing in popularity everywhere. In fact, they're already here in the Midwest. We have one of the most advanced microgrids in North America in Ameren. At their testing and application center in Champaign, Illinois, they built an advanced microgrid. Microgrids are, are more sustainable, so if we have a problem on our higher voltage transmission lines, uh, we would still have the ability to provide service to our customers. If we can operate them and control them, it would elevate the level of reliability to the overall system. What is a microgrid? We actually developed what you see here, which is a demonstration or what we call an experience table, so that people can really get an idea of what the look and feel of a microgrid is and how it operates and how it really provides value to the people within the microgrid and to the community that it supports. We kind of view it as a fence line. So if you look at the table, you can see an outline around the edge of that. So think about that outline as the boundary of the microgrid. And then if we're keeping the fence analogy going, there's a gate. The gate is how we let electricity in. If you disconnect the gate or you close the gate, everything goes dark. The utility substation went dark, followed by all of our non-critical loads. The only one that's still on are the critical loads. These are the ones that have been defined that are life-saving, that are essential to the continued operation. And these loads, as part of the microgrid, get a building level backup system. So the first thing that happens is the microgrid controller verifies the situation. And then once it's assessed the situation, it goes and it confirms, in fact, we had a loss of source, and that's what the blue circles represent again, is confirmation of the loss of source. So now we're ready to actually start reforming. And what we're going to do there, the first thing is it's going to go after those generation sources, and you see the blue lines of communication and all the generating sources that it's going to call on starting up. Right? So now they're in preparation mode. And you might think this takes a while, but all of this happens in three seconds. The next step is to actually bring them online. Now that they're online, you can tell by the transition from blue to white. The next step, let's bring power back to the people. And here it comes. We are now going to close the switches back onto the distribution system. And you can see in yellow, our distribution system lights up. Now we're one step away from being able to bring power back to the entire microgrid. And we're only at 14 seconds. And at this point, the microgrid controller tells the switches to energize all the loads inside the facility. So inside the microgrid, we now have full power and all of that happened within 15 seconds. In 15 seconds, we've gone from a complete outage back to a fully powered microgrid where we have a kilowatt in every corner of the microgrid. 
you probably didn't even have time to find your flashlight. You certainly didn't have time to call the utility. And more importantly, no crew could be dispatched to be able to provide this level of restoration in 15 seconds. Fossil fuels are not an endless resource. We need to start working today to manage those energy challenges of the future. Renewable energy is real, on-site production of energy is real, it's resilient, it's sustainable, and it's cost-effective. My name is Charlie Fredrickson. I'm Vice President of Investments with Faith Technologies. We knew we wanted to build a microgrid to demonstrate how we can create our own on-site renewable energy. We chose the Fox Cities Environmental Learning Campus at Bubolt's Nature Preserve. Their focus is educating the community about nature. Faith and Schneider work so well together. We could tell that they saw the vision of what we wanted to do and they went all in with creating solutions. Our microgrid is very unique. We have five different distributed energy resources. A solar PV field, natural gas generator, micro turbine, battery, hydrogen fuel cell, and the electrolyzer. With the Schneider Electric Energy Control Center and EcoStructure Microgrid Advisor, we're able to take all five resources and manage the power in one unit. So it's collecting data as it relates to weather patterns, the cost of energy out on the grid, and how it's going to use that data to optimize the operation of the microgrid. Faith in Schneider received the very first Distributed Energy Resource Project of the Year Award. The construction of this microgrid is really a tribute to the strong partnership between Faith and Schneider. On-site power generation is the future. Okay, that's the first part of the presentation. Uh, I, I know you, some of you must have some questions, so uh, raise your hand. And so you can raise your hand or you can um, uh, use the chat to say you've got a question or you can just simply unmute yourself and ask a question. <clears throat> Ken, let me ask a question first. Uh, do you have a sense for, um, uh, how much of the power today um, is considered to be economic in a mi microgrid? Uh, you mean sources of power? Or... I mean, if, if you took California as a whole and you said, you know, let's try and do this as much as possible, would you be talking about 5%, 50% what, what, uh, of the power in the, could be uh, in a microgrid structure? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I, I don't think there's a limit uh, to creating an, enough energy to run pretty much everything in California uh, with, with the sun. We have, we have hydro, you know, we have, we have geothermal power up here in Northern California. We have the sun, we have a lot of wind in the Arcan areas. Um, it's uh, a matter of willingness and, uh, you know, to, take on the projects and spend the money. Uh, and, and to show people that unlike burned fossil fuel, once you burn the fossil fuel, that's gone and in, into the atmosphere. The sun goes down, comes back up the next day and you can store that power. Uh, if you're using the sun to also break down water and to make it into hydrogen fuel, then you have a, a fuel that will power everything overnight with hydrogen. If you have enough batteries, um, then you can have your lights and whatever you're doing on overnight with your batteries okay. in the next day. Uh, if you have a little extra solar panel uh, on there just to charge your batteries, then you, your, your home or your business can run on solar power for all the hours that the, the sun is out there. Let, let me ask the question slightly differently. Do you have a sense of how many projects are in um, serious review at this point? Uh, you're talking about uh, projects at the level that, that we're envisioning here? Uh, my yeah, right? in, in California. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's uh, one 
pro the project that I use as the exemplar for a community microgrid project is up in Humboldt County, and it's been uh, online since uh, last summer. It's the Redwood uh, Coast Airport microgrid, and uh, they say it's uh, in uh, Arcata. It's actually in McKinleyville, which is a couple of miles away, but it was started as a, uh, a military facility in World War II, as a uh, you know air facility. Uh, the Coast Guard took it over after the war, uh, and then the Coast Guard has lessened its usage of it. The, uh, commercial flights fly in the, that airport all the time, and it sits very close to Humboldt State University, and it's at the end of a line feeder, which means that uh, there's one feeder that comes in and, and, and energizes this area uh, that's called the Redwood Coast Airport microgrid. Um, so to PG&E and, and uh, the Schatz Energy Center of Humboldt State decided to make it into a full-blown islandable microgrid, meaning it can go offline and run itself when it needs to. It has a variety of things, but that's just one uh, large project that's come to fruition. There's another one in San Francisco called Delencia Garden. It's a, uh, uh, it's a housing development uh, designed for low income folks and it has a, a full on microgrid and it's right in San Francisco. So uh, the fact that you can take uh, a couple of city blocks in a, in a city is pretty amazing and turn it and have a microgrid. There's another project in Oakland called the Eco Block and that's a project of uh, uh, University of California at Berkeley and um, the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Um, there's one in Borrego Springs now in Southern California, which has been there for since 2018. Uh, it's an entire community that's powered uh, by both, uh, uh, it's, still, it's still on the grid, it's hooked into the grid, but it's the end, again at the end of a feeder line and it very often had its uh, electricity cut off because of the nature of the, the, uh, the weather in that part of the state. Uh, so yes, there, uh, and there are multiple other projects that have been uh, planned. Okay. Um, okay. Let's let's. Uh, uh, Sue, you have a question. Well, and I'm, maybe you're getting to this a little bit, um, Ken. But for those that um, already have solar, how does how does that tie in with them? What happens with them? Or are we clear about that at this point? Um, yeah, that's always a, a, that's a good question, Sue. Thanks for asking it, and. It, uh, at right at, at this point, I would say to everybody that can hear my voice right now that you are already connected to a grid, and you know that because you get your you get your electricity from through PG&E wires, and you either buy it from PG&E or you buy it from Sonoma Clean Power. Yeah. Um, what we're talking about here is creating a geographic boundary around something, and in this case, Oakmont, and saying everything within that geographic boundary, we're going to create solar to run it and uh, batteries or some other device which will give us energy when the sun's not out to, to keep it going 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Okay, and your, your question is, what about all these people who already have solar power and batteries? Do they need this? Well, technically no, but what we're planning is a slightly different model than a single home with a single set of batteries that just runs itself. That would, you could call that like a nano grid, for instance, or, or a, a single site microgrid. What we're planning is a variety of, there's a couple of different ways to do that. One, if we had enough open space within the geographic boundary, we would put a solar farm of, of, of high yield solar panels and, uh, and several sites with batteries. And then they would be interconnected to the existing grid through uh, some sophisticated switching and monitoring and control systems with, to power up Oakmont. Another option is to use existing rooftops in Oakmont uh, and add more solar power, enough solar power to, let's say, uh, I'm, I'm just going to throw out a number because we've talked about different types of numbers here, but let's just say between 1,200 to 1,500 rooftops, uh, homes, oh. and uh, they would have solar panels put on them and so and and uh, some sort of a backup battery bolted to the garage and so that would make up the power source for the microgrid and you say well how does that how does that work well it works the same way as any other power grid the solar power 
comes off the roof and it goes through uh, an in inverters and control systems. And then what's not being used by, by the building that it's on is sent out into the microgrid first and then into the greater larger grid where that, that uh, power is then sold uh, at a price that uh, depending on who's doing the arbitrage uh, and, and so that, that's uh, it's the credit of that power being sold off the solar panels that help pay for all the equipment and, and reduce your dependence on the centralized grid where fossil fuel is burned or uh, in, in our case where you don't have much fossil fuel burning here but there's still some um, or you know there's other solar or uh, wind uh, and in our case we also have uh, uh, geothermal up at the in Geyserville from the Calpine plant. But, um, and, the, and, and the methodology for how do we pay for this? Who pays for what? Does everybody pay the same thing? Uh, that's the idea. Uh, I know we're going into, uh, we're talking a little bit about socialism here in a way, but we, we have to come together as people. We can't be just, you know, uh, as, a, as a group to make this work. And um, this is just, again, what another idea about how to get enough electricity to run Oakmont and uh, you know by using all these roofs there, there's yeah. a, you, you do a high, high, go ahead okay um, do you want to segue into the Oakmont discussion first and then we can go back to these questions yes let me let me show you my I have another video it's about nine minutes long and it's particular to Oakmont uh, so I'll do another share here Okay. The Energy Resilience Committee began as an ad hoc solar subcommittee of the Oakmont Long Range Planning Committee in the summer of 2019. Once the mission was defined, it became a standing committee for the purpose of researching solar power and energy storage backup power for Oakmont's three recreation centers. In July 2021, the committee mission included research into the Oakmont Community Microgrid. The central complex comprised of the Central Activity Center the Burger Center and the OVA Maintenance Building does have a microgrid comprised of the Carport Solar PV system, automatic transfer switch, and diesel generator, which provides power for lights and HVAC during grid power outages. The large gray metal boxes in front of the CAC are the solar photovoltaic switch box the automatic transfer switch boxes, and the main electric service entrance for the complex. In January 2020, OVA signed a power purchase agreement contract with TriTech Americas for the Rec Center Solar PV Systems. Installation began in October 2020 after several months of soil and site testing, system design and planning, Santa Rosa City permit approval, etc. The PTO, or permission to operate the three systems, was granted in May of 2021. <laughs> the solar carport PV metrics shown here are estimates provided by the PPA financer TriTech Americas. The east, west, and central complex is a total of 411 kilowatts of solar photovoltaic electric power. The first year savings estimate is $14,715 or a little over $1,200 a month and over a million dollars for the 25 year lease. The system will leave 1,300 barrels of oil unburned, reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 1.7 million pounds, and save 450 acres of trees.
The community microgrid, the OCM, is about 25 times the capacity of the rec center systems at 9 megawatts or 9 million watts. The extrapolated savings based on TriTech America's estimates are $441,500 savings in energy costs for the first year, $31 million over 25 years, 38,000 barrels of oil unburned, 53 million pounds of carbon not sent into the atmosphere, and 14,000 acres of trees saved. The OCM has some impressive consultants and collaborators. Our primary consultants on research, feasibility, and application to the Community Microgrid Enablement Program is Kenwood Energy, a local and highly experienced team in renewable and sustainable energy. PG&E created the CMEP program with communities like Oakmont and Mind. Our CMEP coordinator revealed that the meetings our committee had with PG&E at their San Francisco headquarters, as well as here in the OVA offices, definitely kept us at the front of their planning for the CMEP program. Sonoma Clean Power has conferred with us on several occasions about our energy concerns and is a supporter of the microgrid concept for Oakmont. EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, has met with the OERC on multiple occasions since 2019 in attempting to qualify OVA for some grant-funded energy storage projects. The OERC has had several conversations with the CPUC's Resilience and Microgrid Working Group and is a party to the proceedings of rulemaking 19-09-009, which is a response to Senate Bill 1339 on distributed energy and energy generation. It is also a response to Governor Newsom's declaration of an energy emergency for California in July of 2021. The OERC has conferred with the Center for Sustainable Energy or the Energy Center on microgrids and combined heat and power solutions. The Climate Center has been gracious with their time in conversations and attending the first live OERC microgrid education seminar with comments and observations concerning policy for renewable and sustainable energy. A few of our local and state government supporters are the Oakmont Village Association Board of Directors, the Santa Rosa City Council, California State Assemblyman Jim Wood, and California State Senator Mike McGuire, who has tasked his staff to find some funding for the Oakmont Community Microgrid. This slide shows a simple graphic about what one concept of a community microgrid looks like. On the left are solar voltaic panels and energy storage. On the right is the fossil fuel alternative generator, along with electric consumers, in this case residences and businesses in Oakmont. In the center you see the interconnection with the utility and the central hub controller, the computer brains of the system. Not shown are other potential sources of power, such as natural gas-powered turbine generators, hydrogen-powered turbine and reciprocal engine generators, hydrogen fuel-making electrolyzers, and others. The current status of the Community Microgrid Enablement Program application process is that the OCM is at step five of an 11-step process which Kenwood Energy has been tasked to consult and provide assistance in meeting the process requirements. Kenwood Energy is also assisting the OERC with applying to FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Assistance Grant Funding Plan through the California Office of Emergency Services. Benefits of the Oakmont Community Microgrid. Energy resiliency, which is rapid response to loss of electrical power through automatic switching, solar energy, and energy storage. Energy reliability through local energy generation, storage, and decreased reliance on grid distributed energy. No 
upfront costs. Cost savings from fixed rate payments. The owners or owners of the microgrid sell the energy to pay for the equipment at a fixed rate and the energy consumers pay a fixed rate for electricity. Reduction of carbon emissions as CO2. Operation and maintenance by a third party owner. Investment and community ownership opportunity. Inclusion of existing solar PV and batteries. For further information about the Oakmont Community Microgrid, email ken.smith at oakmontvillage.com or info.oerc at oakmontvillage.com. We're back. You know, I stopped to share and my screen went black. <laughs> well, we, we can all see you. <laughs> I can't see any of you. I don't know what you're doing out there. Uh, let's see and what's going on here. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Good, okay. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. I'm about to pull the trigger on getting solar from my house. Is mm -hmm. there any, uh, advantages where, where wherever we are in the microgrid that would help me at this moment? No. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think that the right now, uh, the microgrid at its earliest inception is probably three years away. If that helps, uh, uh, there's a there's a we're in, we're in a process with the community microgrid enablement program, which is going to take about uh, 12 to 18 months, and then from that point on, it's uh, uh, design and uh, uh, you know equipment procurement and uh, getting a contractor and then getting it getting it built out, and then we all and then. Anybody who's got solar on their home knows that the slowest part of the process is the permission part, uh, the permission from PGD to operate your system, um, anywhere from three to six months, depending. So, uh, so I, I hope that answers your question. Well, you answered one of them. Uh, so it would be at least six months before I'd be operational. I'm just, I can't answer, but for your system, I know for what, that's, that's what it taken for mine. Uh, it, was, it was installed in November of 2021, and I just got permission to operate yesterday. So, yeah, that's what, five months, November, December, set five months. So, uh, and I've heard of other people, it's taken up to six months, so. All right. Uh, once we have a microgrid, What's the benefit for those who haven't put on solar on their roofs? And what is the benefit for those who have put solar on their roofs? The benefit for those that don't have solar on the roof is they're gonna be part of the microgrid. They're gonna be, they're gonna be able to, uh, and I don't, wanna, I don't want to present this as that this is gonna be free for everybody, it's not. Somebody has to pay for something somewhere along the line, but you, you pay for electricity right now. And uh, the rates went up 8% this year. They're gonna go up 18%, between 13 and 18% again next year. Um, they're not gonna go down. Uh, so investing in solar, if you can do it, 
is not a short-term investment. It's a long-term investment, but uh, under the current NEM 2.0, which is the net energy metering, uh, if you if you invested today, you could pay off your system probably in about between six and ten years, depending on how big your system is and how much electricity you use. Um, for those people who, um, you know, and, and, and you're still going to be in the microgrid. So uh, for those people who, who are never going to invest in electric uh, solar or batteries, they would have the benefit of. Uh, being able to share energy with with their neighbors in the microgrid and to be backed up by their with uh, by their neighboring uh, batters in the microgrid, and, and and the way the way this is going to work is that once if you know depending on who we ha have built it and financed it, uh, there would be a flat rate, uh, which would probably I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess based on some numbers that I've pushed around on a piece of paper with. Some people looking over my shoulder that if let's just say you were paying uh and this again i don't think this is an average but let's just say you were paying 100 dollars a month for electricity uh and, but that's not just electricity because everybody here if you're a pg e customer you pay delivery charges as well and uh, uh for example my pg e bill for electricity for january was 69 dollars and the delivery charges for that electricity was $217. So but to go back to what the average, the average user would pay here, uh, if you were paying $100 a month before, you'd probably be paying about $40 or less a month after the microgrid is installed. Uh, and for those people who have invested it in their solar systems, it, you, you didn't waste your money because you're still going to be in the same situation, you're going to be selling your excess electricity into the grid and getting a credit for it uh, on your bill at the end of the year. Uh, and some people get checks at the end of the year. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen much longer, but because um, no matter what we do, we still have to deal with pg and &E. pg and &E is the elephant in the room, and they're going to try everything they can to try to recoup some money that they're going to lose because we're not buying electricity from them anymore. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I can I uh, uh, put some thoughts on top of that, Ken? Sure. We we when we bought our uh, solar system, which was July of uh, 2019, uh, we we used a roughly six percent a year increase in electric costs to evaluate the value of our system compared to the value of staying the cost of staying completely with PG&E, or actually snow and clean power to be technical. Um, but nowhere in our thinking have we ever come across the situation we're in as of the last two weeks, which is the potential that literally all energy costs related to fossil fuels are going to skyrocket because of shortages, yes. okay? Um, and if the people haven't followed it, 50% of Europe's fossil fuel usage comes from Russia, okay? And so when we talk about cutting them off, that's what they're talking about, okay? That is not gonna be cheap. So we can come up with all the alternatives, but the truth of the matter is the only way we're gonna protect ourselves in terms of shutdowns, in terms of cost, is to find some way to microgrid Oakmont. And what Ken's talking about always comes back to the same fundamental concept I was introduced to when we started talking about solar, which is the electrons don't know where they came from. So if the electrons on your roof and it's making its way into your house and you don't need it, and it goes back out into the yard and through the distribution your, your, your neighbor next door is gonna get that electron. It's kind of a crazy way of thinking of it, but it's true. And what Ken's talking about is collecting them all in one bundle. So if we can all come in this together and the technology is right there now, we're at the cutting edge of the ability to actually do that technically. 
And we don't have to have every house in Oakmont be on solar, but those that are benefit because they get some extra income from that. And those that aren't pay because they don't have the solar, but they have the power. That's no different than you're paying Sonoma Clean Power or you're paying pg and &E. It's just that it's all here in Oakland. Is that a fair summary, Ken? Yeah, yes, you're gonna pay somebody. You, you know, uh, it's never, you know, you gotta pay for it somewhere, somehow. Uh, I, you know, I, I remember years ago uh, being in Humboldt County and, and people kept back way back then in the 1970s saying, we're gonna go off the grid. And uh, I'm going, well, how are you going to get power? Well, there are these new things. There are these solar panels, and we all laugh. But you know, we're we are, as George just pointed out, we're pushed into a corner because we we don't get to control because anything in this regard unless we take it over and make we make electricity ourselves. We control it, and and uh, we can protect ourselves uh, because electricity runs everything. We can't live that. We, you, we could live without it. It, it wouldn't. It would be a mean existence, to put it briefly, uh, you know, to try to live without electricity. So this is a way to have our community make electricity, and it's always more efficient to make it where you use it, or to use it where it's made. Um, there's no. There's no argument about that. If you have to, if it has to be transported, it's going to have a transportation cost. You know. So the other, so this is for me, and because I'm uh, pretty very passionate about this, this is a, a no-brainer. Even though I have um, you know solar panels on my roof and a, a modest electric battery on the side of my house, I'm still going to my my hope is to make this work for us and have it up and running in uh, in three years. And I think it's doable. Uh, I'm talking to people. We're talking to people at the, the PG&E. They're helping us. Believe it or not. Talking to people with, at, at the state level with grant money that are do, going, they're 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 doing uh, all kinds of twisties with their bodies to get us some grant money to make this work. So uh, I I have confidence that it's just a matter of finding, you know, uh, all of the right parts and putting them together, and that's happening. Things are becoming very clear as we move forward. Okay, Phil, you have a question. Yes. Um... If we are successful in uh, having our microgrid, how is PG&E still going to be involved? Because we are still going to be using their wires that uh, takes the electricity from the microgrid and delivers it to the homes. Yes, we're using their we're using their infrastructure that they own. That's how they'll still be involved. And what are they going to charge for that? Uh, well, currently. Uh, I, I think uh, I haven't I haven't gotten a charge for the what's called the connection or interconnection fee, but uh, I, I've heard that it's around twelve dollars. But there's a couple of other little things. It's, it's about twenty bucks a month to be connected, um, and which is a whole lot less than the three hundred dollars I paid in January. So uh, you know um, we have we again I, I said this once before I'll say it again PG and E is the elephant in the room. Um, you know, I, I don't want to malign the company because I, I think the, boot, the boots on the ground, the people we talk with, the middle managers, they're all on our side because they live here too. They're, they're consumers as well. What, what, they, what happens in those offices affects them the same as it affects us. So I've had very good, very good uh, um, you know, uh, conversations and uh, we've gotten help from PG&E to, to make this work. And so we're going to follow their plan because they understand how how what what's going on and uh, they want to they want to make it work. Uh, but again, they're going to try to charge those people that aren't on a microgrid more money to support this, and they want to try to charge people who have solar on their roof an extra fee to support the, their shortfall in their income. But it's a it's a system that was. Uh, you know, it's actually a 19th century system. It was the first, the first grid, grids were built in the 1800s. So um, it's just a concept that's never, that's, that's never progressed until the last 20 years. Uh, and we know that this is what we have to do. You know, it's, it's nice to have a power plant belching out smoke 75 miles from your house where you don't see it. You don't worry about it. You don't think about it, but we're, 
but that's not that's that's a problem that's a big problem and, and we know that's a problem so it just makes sense to make our own electricity right here where we live we've got plenty of sun here and uh we can make this work okay um lynn's got a question but first of all wally do you have a question or are you just waving your hand no i don't know how to do the hand thing i have a comment and three questions should i go ahead oh, you're yeah. on We'll get Lynn next. Um, PG&E ought to realize that if we do this and produce all this electricity, they won't have to build more sources. That's my yeah, comment. Not, yeah. I'll comment on your comment. They, they, they've known that for a while. They, they've not built any new sources of, of, of fossil fuel or any kind of other uh, uh, spinning rotary generated fuel uh, for years. Uh, because the solar is so prevalent, it, it's taken up all the all. They haven't had to build any new, new generating facilities. What is the hydrogen reserve? Hydrogen reserve. I'm not, I'm in what context? Well, it was instead of batteries, oh, or in addition to batteries. Yeah, there's a couple of things. Hydrogen fuel. Yes. Uh, well, hydrogen is a fuel. It's been experimented with a lot. It's uh, it's it's very uh, efficient. Uh, it's non-polluting. The, 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 the emissions from a hydrogen-fueled engine is water vapor, uh, so it's non-polluting. And and the, uh, the the fuel to make the hydrogen is water, so it has to go through an electrolysis process, which is power intensive. But if we use solar power, meaning we add more solar panels. To just do that, then, then that, that makes that a viable uh, al alternative to a battery, um, or not an alternative so much as an adjunct. I think we have to look at it more like it's not going to be, hey, this is just going to be batteries and, and solar. It's going to have to be some other things because batteries have a, have a lifespan. Uh, it's getting longer and longer, but they also have a, a, a an attrition rate, meaning they go they 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 are less and less efficient the older they get. Uh, that's not to say that that they're going to run out, you know, real soon. We're talking, uh, you know, some people are talking 20 years, some people are talking 40 years. I think I think those numbers are kind of long for most of us in this uh, chat room here. So, uh, but uh, but hydrogen is is uh, probably uh, the best uh, option for uh, adding power, uh, extra power to uh, the backup system. And when we talk, talk about an energy storage system, hydrogen is the first fuel that's generally mentioned. There are other things, but they require using natural gas or something else to get them you know, halfway there. Wally, did you have a third question? Yes, sir. Um, is PG&E gonna, gonna be sending us bills or are we gonna get their um, data so we're, we're doing our own billing for residents? Uh, they would still be doing the billing, and I imagine that there would be some sort of a service fee for that. So, uh, uh, yeah, we 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 won't. You know, the other another, you know, another a model of this is to create what's called a community controlled aggregate, which is what actually what this is going to be. But we don't want to be at the level of of, of owning uh, a generation facility, so to speak, uh, and that has to deal with. Uh, the regulations that that govern CCAs like Snow McLean Power because they they buy energy from the uh, markets from the Queso market, uh, California Independent System Operator, and and so they have to do our work on arbitrage every, every 15 minutes. You know, there's an arbitrage point, and that takes some pretty sophisticated monitoring and, and uh, equipment to do that. And we we don't want to be doing that. We'll that's something that uh, we, we'd like to be an adjunct to SCP, I think as a generation source, you know, that would be great. And then they can do the, all the queso arbitrage and take care of all that part. And then we would have a third company, a third uh, party company that would handle uh, maintenance and operation of all the equipment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add on here if I can, Ken. Um, sure. um, this is very much of a moving target. There are a lot of moving parts, Wally. Okay, we can make some guesses now as to what it's gonna look like. But the truth of the matter is the PUC the governor, uh, there's just a batch of stuff that's out there that's changing at the minute, you know, and just as for right now, we're looking at the issue of 
how do we respond to the possibility that we're going to have 10% less fuel available? Okay, because of the Russia thing. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, okay, Lynn, you're on. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. One is related to Healdsburg. And I know they don't, they are off the grid. They don't have PG&E. Do they have this kind of a community grid for the whole town? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with what Healdsburg does for utilities. I know Palo Alto uh, packages their utilities, their gas, electric, uh, garbage, uh, well, water, all, all in one utility bill. But I don't know. I don't know what Hillsburg does. They may have a generation facility. Uh, I've not heard of them having a, a, a microgrid, though. Okay. So my other comment question has to do with cost. Um, as I saw your videos, it looks so wonderful and expensive. And then I was interested in the line when you said no upfront cost. Correct. How is that? How is this possible? What What are you talking about? Uh, I mean, it, isn't this a really expensive program system? Uh, you know. Uh... Yes, it is. Uh, but you'd be happy to know that there is a consortium of investors, these um, tech billionaires you keep hearing about, that uh, this is one source, one idea that uh, I, I get together uh, one Thursday a month with some other folks that are trying to do similar plans in their communities. And uh, we're talking about these tech billionaires that have put together a venture capital group. And as soon as I heard venture capital, I thought, well, I, so what? You know, but what their, their venture capital group is finding projects, hopefully like this, and saying, look, we're going to loan you the money to do this. And, but we're not going to charge you any interest. You just have to pay it back. And they've figured out a point in time to do that. Yes, everything will cost something. Um, but when I say no upfront cost, that's what I mean. You, you know, we're, it'll, it'll be built, it'll be up, it'll be running. You won't pay anything until you start using electricity. Uh, Ken, can I draw the analogy if I might? Uh, okay. If it, in fact, PG&E needs more power next year and it chooses to write a long-term contract with somebody who's gonna build a natural gas power plant to provide that power. That company then goes out and borrows the money to build the plant based on the fact that it has a 20 year contract with BG&E to give them a certain amount of money every year, okay? It's just a straight financial calculation, just like all other uh, corporation loan stuff. Think about what Ken's talking about in the same framework. That's in fact how we financed the solar panels that are sitting behind me in this at the CAC. Okay. Yeah. They were financed. We didn't, not, hmm? we didn't pay a dime up front. Yeah. No, no Oakmont, the OBA, no Oakmont are paid a penny for that. What happened was there was a company out there that said, Oh, you're willing to pay so much each year for the energy that this produces. And based on that, <coughs> we, we will upfront all the costs. Okay. Uh, Bruce, you're next, and then Phil. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Okay, yeah. um, first of all, just sort of confirming what we have now. Um, you know, we, we have the solar panels, we have the switching, and we have a large generator. It, it looks like to me that, I mean, the generator is only going to be used in the eventuality that PG&E cuts us off. Yep. And, and so under right. normal circumstances, what we have now is the uh, larger equivalent of a residential grid tie system where basically you, you generate all the power you can, but you're using the PG&E grid as a, a super battery or, or energy storage to supply you anything extra and to take up anything extra that you generate. Is that fair to say? And, and uh, it, I'm talking about it, where we are right now. Yes. 
Okay. And so in three years, you hope to have a the, the community microgrid. Uh, the first question, well, what we have now, it also, as I understand it, will power the central complex. Um, does it provide any power to any home in Oak Park? No. Okay. But in three years, you hope to have a community grid that will do the whole thing all the way out to the boundaries of Oakmont? That's a question. That's, that's the plan. That's the plan. That's, that's what we're, we're planning to do. Yes. And so that depends on getting funding, either grants or loans or one of these long-term contracts uh, in order to add additional equipment. Am I, am I, I correct there? Okay. Um, so you're going to have an awful lot of storage, right? And batteries, or I mean, do you even know what you're going to do yet? It might be one of these hydrolyzers. It might be any of the components that are possible in a microgrid system, I guess. Yes, there's many, many different ways to do that, and and we we have done uh, some modeling, but it's you know, for lack of a better term, it's like the the the, you know, the back of the napkin drawing type of thing. Uh, it's you know all of the, the technology is there. That's the technology is not right. not the issue. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, one of the issues we have right now, to go back to your initial uh, creating a model about what we have now in existence with with uh, PG&E, is that and, and, and George talks about this all the time, is that we're we're pretty good to go with clean energy until we get to 4 p.m. and then <laughs> that's when that's when the, the the reciprocal engine fossil fuel generators kick in, right? And that's and and start spewing lots of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and so and that's that's not just here. That's in a lot of places. You know, it's just all over. Uh, and there's just the not there's you know it's because the uh, you know PG&E PG&E's first answer to any energy shortfall is get more get more diesel generators over there that's their okay. first thought that's what they do calistoga calistoga has its massive diesel generator microgrid for the downtown and it is so polluted that they had to build these containment stacks 40 feet into the air to keep from killing the people that live around this thing uh, you know, it, oh. you know th that's that's not that's that's not a uh, a formula for the future. That's unsustainable. We know that. We've known that for 50 years. It's unsustainable. It's not good. It's bad for us. Uh, you know. Uh, so the sun, it's it's pro proven technology. The sun can make it work, and it, and it, and we know with pretty good certainty that we're going to have it every day. I guess I, I see the biggest challenge is really the storage because if you if you, if you it's whether you talk about it at the residential level, the microgrid level, or the state level, um, as you say, when we come to four o'clock in the afternoon, we need more energy than we can generate, and so you have to have storage, and furthermore, it's complicated by you don't know what the weather is going to be. So it's like, if you want an, an off-grid system, I want panels on my house and I have batteries. Um, if I have storage for, let's say one or two days of average usage uh, in case it gets cloudy, that may work for most of the time, but every once in a while, there'll be a long cloudy spell and I'm in trouble. And that's when you go back to depending on the PG&E grid or PG&E goes and has to buy power from other states. And it's how much storage can you provide? And of course, air, the storage just goes up, the cost goes up linearly. Um, yeah. well, seems like that's the biggest challenge. You know, when, we, when we talk about storage, there's, there's a lot of options uh, uh, as a, uh, you know, beyond lithium cobalt batteries, because those are sure. the most expensive. Uh, there's a lot of systems, and and so that's why uh, I bring up the uh, the, the electrolyzers and, and hydrogen energy, uh, yeah. because 
that is an energy that's an energy storage system because you make the hydrogen and you store it and then you use it in a reciprocating or a turbine engine generator uh, and it's clean. Uh, it's, it's not as clean as solar panels. I mean, once the solar panel is built, there's no there's no, no uh, pollution, pollution yeah. coming off. Of so so uh, and there there are other there are companies working on what 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 the technology is is long long duration batteries. Um, so, you know, a battery that once it's charged up, uh, won't be fully discharged for a week, you know, so, uh, and would power up, uh, kind of, let's say, uh, 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 two megawatts, you know, that, that's a, and, and they're big, you know, they'd be like the size of a couple of semi trailers, you know, parked in the parking lot. Huh. And, and we talked about doing a demonstration here with one and it was an iron, I can't remember what it was, it was some kind of a head two kinds of metal in it and some solution and, and it was a flow battery type of thing but it was a very long duration you know uh most most gasoline power vehicles have a, a type of flow battery where you have electron flow between two terminals and it's in a solution and you know it's a lead acid battery you know for all intents and purposes okay one that's, that's still viable Okay, one final short question and unrelated to what I said before, but if you're if three years from now, everything comes to fruition, we have a community microgrid. Um, will every home in Oakmont that's currently connected to the PG&E network, which is every home, um, be part of that microgrid? Or is it something that someone can opt in or opt out? Well, I, I think legally we have to give the option to people to opt in or opt out. Um, I I can't imagine that you know I I could see that where if someone had solar and batteries and you know they didn't want to be part of this they could opt out. But I think everybody who doesn't have that certainly would want to opt in. But that's yeah. just my feeling. I mean, you can keep paying three hundred dollars a month if you want to PG&E and plan on it being higher and higher, but it's not going to go down. Or you can at least uh, you know mitigate some of that increase because it doesn't matter what we do. PG&E is still going to find a way to, uh, you know, raise some sorts of rates on in, on everybody because they have, <laughs> you know, in, in, income shortfall. But you know, and it's not fair to to put those that income shortfall on on uh, communities that are, you know, that are uh, lower income, and that's and who can't afford to do any kind of, you know, solar or backup or anything like that. So okay. uh, I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna can take over and let uh, Phil ask the last question here. I've and got then, one. Okay, Phil and then Ron, let's try and keep them short. First is a comment. How about a future topic for this group would be uh, storage technologies. I've read, done some research on batteries and there's some interesting stuff out there. So now for my question, does or is there a dollar amount on the best guesstimate on what our microgrid would cost if it was installed today? Um, I could give you a range. <laughs> uh, the numbers that I've heard based on just chatting with people, because we, you know, we we looked at several different models, and I think the low at the low end was 32 million, and at the high end was closer to 100 million. Um, but that was from a company that was uh, also doing venture capital. So I, I think they may have, that may have been some bias there. Uh, I, I would think that, you know, uh, based on uh, equipment prices right now and uh, what, what, you know, the, the, the technician's hourly fee and what you got to pay for somebody who um, knows how to put all this together. Uh, I, I think we're probably looking at the, the 35 to 50 million dollar range. We are looking at the possibility of, of uh, engaging what's called an ESCO, uh, an energy and service company, uh, like it was it, you know, one of the videos with the, it's a Schneider. And they do the eco structure. Uh, they come in and, and they do everything. You know, they do they do the whole thing, and uh, then basically you, it's it's kind of like a power purchase agreement. Uh, and then, you know, then they just charge everybody the same amount of money uh, a month to use to have, use the service, which has been the service is the energy. Uh, 
I, that's one way to do it. I, I, I tend to think that's not what we want to do because I find that that's not as equitable uh, probably for everybody here. Uh, and I think it puts everything in their control. And, and you know, ultimately, maybe a company like that would come in and give us, tell us something that would be, you know, equitable and we would have a certain amount of feedback into what's how they're running things later on you know that that's certainly feasible um, we haven't really spent a lot of time vetting uh, those types of companies because uh, we're so involved with just trying to get through the cmep progress uh, process and also the uh, grant hazard mitigation grant fund process that's taking up most of our time right now um, though kenwood energy has done a single line drawing plan and basically it penciled out you know at retail rates at 57 million dollars and if i could put that in context differently uh those are, numbers are somewhat comparable to a natural gas plant being built of a some similar size so they may sound large but they're not large compared to what it costs to build electric power plants Ron, you get the last question. Okay, uh, two things. Uh, I'm a very strong advocate for solar. Um, I was a sailor uh, a good part of my life and spent four years sailing through the South Pacific. And before I left, I left uh, the biggest challenge was how do I recharge my batteries? And the answer is you run your big engine for an hour, you use a gallon of diesel, and you run your alternator, which recharges your batteries. And that was the only technology we had. When I sailed to the Tuamotos, which is part of French Polynesia, I sailed to a little atoll, and I discovered four solar panels on every roof. And this was back in 1986. And as I became friends with the chief, I learned that the island had a major hurricane two years prior that had destroyed the generator and all the homes. People survived in the mayor's office, which was built of CBS. But in the rebuilding, they decided to put solar on rather than buy a new generator because the, uh, the men had to every day go out and cut coconut and then every two weeks, the coconut boat would come and buy the dried coconut, which they would use for, to make the money to buy diesel at, in a circle. So they decided on putting solar in and every home had four panels, a plug for their ghetto blaster, a uh, fluorescent light, a car battery, which was checked by the local gendarme in everyone's home, and they were basically self-sufficient for lighting and power from those four panels. Needless to say, the first thing I did when I got down to Papieta was buy four panels. And I was independent, and that was back in 1986. So I love the concept. I will join you in any way I can help you in getting the microgrid uh, created. I'm going to get solar from my house, and I have a question for everyone on, is what company did you choose for your solar panels, those who have them? George? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, you were going to go uh, jump in. Phil, why don't Phil? you jump in? I went with Tesla and I was very, very satisfied. Good. All right. Well, we went with Tesla and I would rate them a little bit low because uh, communication and things are an issue with them, but we love the system. It's fantastic. All right. Uh, I have a Sonnen system put in by Synergy Solar. It's a high end system. We have a 20 kilowatt battery. Anybody else want to input at this stage? I, I bought a, I, I'm leasing a uh, Sunrun system. It's a five, 
5.7 kilowatts and the battery I think is nine kilowatt hours, which is small, but it's enough to run, you know, the lights in the house. It won't run the AC or the or the any of the HVAC or anything. But I figured that was uh, that was a good okay. I have a Tesla point. Model Three, and you're right. It's hard to communicate with them, but uh, the technology is brilliant. Uh, Philip, uh, or can a question for you? Is there any way of financing uh, my system outside of Tesla? You're locked into a 10 year lease with them and I would much rather have a 20 year lease. Are there any financial solutions to financing my system? I cannot speak to that. Yeah, neither. I'm not really, you know, conversant in single home systems at this point. So. I, I bought mine outright. I didn't do the leasing system. I, I think I think the county doesn't the county um, have a um, yes a loan you, system. Yes. Maybe you can speak to that, George. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The short answer is I like, can. Why don't you speak to it? Yeah, okay. it's, it's the, uh, the, the Sonoma County uh, Division of Energy and Sustainability, and they're listed on the county website. And yes, they do that. Uh, they can add it onto your uh, your county tax bill if you want. There's a variety of ways. There, I would I, I encourage anybody here that's thinking about doing anything in the in the form of energy conservation, uh, meaning uh, you know. Uh, having them come out and they'll look at your home and say, here's what you got to do. You need new windows or a new door. There's a gap over there. And they'll also talk about uh, other, you know, energy device devices that are, more, you know, better energy devices. And, and they, can, they can help you with getting solar through a uh, financing system. And they, and they can all, they'll also finance all that stuff through, for, through their. Through and their. can you tell me the name again, please? Or it's the, it's the Sonoma County Division of Energy and sustainability. And they have staff members, Ron, who are designed to specifically uh, help you come through questions like that. All right. Does anyone happen to have a phone number for them? I would no, suggest, no. Why, why don't we, why don't you go back to the Google side? Um, they'll, they'll come, they'll come right up. It's, it's Sonoma, Sonoma County, uh, you know, website has it. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, we're going to wrap up today. Thank you very much, Ken. That was very helpful um, in our Later. charter of trying to figure out what the world's going to be like for us over the next five to 10 years. This has gone from being something that was like a, a pipe dream to something that actually has some sustainable real reality. So maybe we will be at the cutting edge. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. All right, you're yeah. welcome. Thank you, everyone. Bye, we'll Later. see you next month.